If people think the semiconductor war is about NVIDIA chips, sanctions, and who gets the next batch of H100s, they're only seeing the surface. The real story is buried upstream in a place few ever look, the chemistry labs of Japan. And inside those labs are the materials that quietly keep the global chip industry functioning. Buried among them is a single class of chemicals so indispensable that cutting the supply would do more to stall China's high-tech rise than any warship, missile, or sanctions list. They're called photoresists, and while the name sounds like something you clean a camera lens with, they are the molecular paint that lets the modern world exist. Whenever a chip is manufactured, the first step is coating a wafer with a thin film of a light-sensitive chemical. A beam of light hits the surface and alters the chemical structure in specific areas, allowing circuits to be printed with astonishing precision. That chemical layer has to respond cleanly to light, remain stable during baking, react predictably during etching, and hold up to a manufacturing process that feels like a cross between astrophysics and witchcraft. This is the photoresist layer, and if you don't have it, you don't get transistors. If you don't get transistors, you don't get chips. If you don't get chips, everything from AI clusters to advanced weapons becomes expensive artwork. There are many types of photoresists, and they correspond to the wavelengths of light used in lithography. Legacy factories still use older G-line and I-line materials for everyday electronics, simple controllers, autos, and consumer goods. China can already produce these domestically without much issue. Move a little higher into deep ultraviolet territory, where 248 nanometer KRF and 193 nanometer ARF lithography dominate, and the supply chain becomes more technical but still accessible. Chinese firms have made visible progress here, producing acceptable materials for older mid range nodes and winning some adoption in domestic fabs. But at the very top end is a completely different world. These are the chemicals used for extreme ultraviolet lithography, technology that allows the printing of components used in advanced AI chips, flagship smartphone processors, radar systems, satellites, and high-performance computing. And that level is nearly impossible for newcomers to break into. This is the category where Japan sits like a dragon on a pile of treasure, a small circle of Japanese companies, JSR, Shinetsu Chemical, Tokyo Oka Kogyo, and a few others, control virtually the entire global supply of high-end photoresists. Market estimates place them around the 90% mark for advanced products and almost the entirety of EUV-grade material. These are not household names, yet inside the semiconductor industry, they are treated like the oxygen tanks of a spaceship. If the supply stops, the ship doesn't explode dramatically on screen, it simply suffocates. Japan didn't luck into this position. It spent decades nurturing a materials ecosystem that favored extreme precision. The country's industrial culture, obsessive testing, absurdly high purity requirements, and a tendency to treat manufacturing recipes like sacred scrolls created firms that quietly became globally indispensable. Over time, these companies grew from specialized chemical suppliers into pillars of the semiconductor world. But the turning point came more recently, when Japan's government began treating photoresist production as a matter of national security rather than simple commerce. The clearest signal came when Japan's state-backed investment arm moved to acquire JSR, the world's largest photoresist maker, in a multi-billion dollar deal. It wasn't a takeover aimed at profit, it was about control. By bringing JSR under direct national influence, Tokyo ensured that Japan could act quickly in any crisis without worrying about pushback from shareholders, foreign investors, or competing interests. This was a quiet reshuffling of strategic assets. No speeches, no drama, just the calm repositioning of a crucial company into the protective arms of the state. Meanwhile, China has been trying very hard to catch up. It poured billions into domestic materials research, seeded hundreds of startups, and filled research labs with teams attempting to reverse engineer formulas that took Japan decades to perfect. Progress has been real, but limited. China has been able to produce lower end resists at useful scale. It has made inroads into KRF production. It is beginning to test domestic ARF resists with Chinese fabs. 
These achievements matter for China's ambition to reduce reliance on foreign suppliers. But none of these breakthroughs touch the high-end EUV market, where the technical complexity skyrockets and the margin for error disappears. The difficulty lies in the nature of photoresist chemistry. These materials demand a level of purity, consistency, and reactivity that is extremely unforgiving. A microscopic contamination can ruin an entire wafer batch. A slight misreaction can alter the electrical characteristics of the chip. A change in viscosity or coating behavior can break production lines that cost tens of billions of dollars. Every fab has to validate new resist suppliers through endless tests, stress conditions, defect scans, and yield trials. It often takes years for a new supplier to be trusted. Even when the resist technically works, the fabs may stick with a legacy provider simply because yields are known, predictable, and safe. Now imagine trying to enter that market from scratch. You can build reactors, hire chemists, and buy testing instruments, but you can't replicate 50 years of accumulated process knowledge by throwing money at it. China can build steel factories overnight. It can build entire cities in three years. But building a chemistry ecosystem with this level of refinement is like trying to speed run a craft that normally requires three generations of master artisans. And at the high end, China is still nowhere close. There was already a warning about how vulnerable China remains. In 2021, when Shinetsu briefly paused certain shipments, reportedly due to logistics disruptions rather than politics, Chinese fabs immediately felt the shock. SMIC saw its production efficiency drop. YMTC faced delays. These were small disruptions, far from a full embargo, yet they were enough to reveal how thin the margin really was. China can stockpile some materials, but photoresists degrade within months. Their shelf life is unforgiving, and that makes stockpiling a short-term crutch rather than a strategic buffer. Fast forward into 2025, and the tension becomes harder to ignore. Japan updated its export control rules, expanding the categories of items that could require special permissions when exported to certain destinations. The revisions were technical, bureaucratic, and wrapped in legal phrasing, but the effect was unmistakable. Japan had given itself the authority to tighten photoresist exports to China whenever it felt necessary. Beijing protested the move and accused Tokyo of weaponizing trade under the umbrella of economic security. Japanese officials kept their tone diplomatic but made no effort to hide that semiconductor materials were now considered nationally strategic. Insiders in the industry began to whisper about the possibility that Japan might one day use its control over photoresists as leverage. Analysts in Taiwan and the United States discussed the scenario. Policy circles in Tokyo debated whether such a move would be wise or destabilizing. Chinese officials, meanwhile, warned publicly about rising Japanese restrictions. The entire topic floated in the background, like a quiet storm cloud. People sometimes imagine geopolitics through dramatic imagery. Aircraft carriers, missile launches, armies on the move. But the world rarely shifts through theatrics. It shifts through supply chains. If Japan halted the export of EUV-grade photoresist tomorrow, the results would be slow, clinical, and devastating. Chinese fabs producing advanced chips would keep running for a few months on existing inventory. Nothing dramatic would happen at first, but as weeks passed, yields would fall, delays would creep in, and production lines would begin taking damage that couldn't be fixed without fresh materials. Fabrication tools optimized for Japanese resists would struggle to adapt to backup suppliers, assuming those backup suppliers could even provide the required quality. Every highly advanced chip design, AI accelerators, smartphone SOCs, radar processors, encryption modules would run into scheduling problems. Some would be pushed back, others would be produced in smaller batches, and the most advanced ones might simply not be produced at all.
This wouldn't cripple the entire Chinese economy. China's industrial strength is far too broad for that. But it would push back China's high-end semiconductor ambitions by several years. That delay would ripple across industries. Smartphone makers would face hardware constraints. AI companies would struggle to scale. Military projects relying on advanced processors would need to adjust timelines. Cloud computing expansion would slow. The entire technological trajectory of China's domestic ecosystem would be nudged backward, not by an enemy or by sabotage, but by a missing chemical that only a few companies on Earth know how to make. China wouldn't sit still in such a scenario. It has its own pressure points, rare earth metals, magnets, battery materials, and key minerals that the rest of the world depends on could become bargaining chips. Japanese automakers would feel the pinch immediately. Korean and Western electronics producers would be affected. A new spiral of restrictions, countermoves, and emergency deals could emerge. But the asymmetry is still significant. Rare earths are painful to replace, yet replacements exist. Mines can be reopened or expanded. Processing can shift to other countries with enough investment. Alternatives for photoresist at the EUV level don't exist outside of Japan, at least not in workable form today. This imbalance is why the topic has started appearing in the conversations of diplomats, defense analysts, and economists. The world is waking up to the realization that the bottlenecks of the future might not be chips themselves, but the ingredients that allow those chips to be printed in the first place. The semiconductor war is moving away from machines and software and toward molecules and supply chains. Whoever controls the chemistry controls the hardware. Whoever controls the hardware controls the computation. And computation is the backbone of everything from AI breakthroughs to advanced weapon systems. This shift is not happening loudly. There are no sanctions headlines or tech CEOs on stage announcing dramatic new alliances. The movement is quieter. Japan is consolidating its materials industry. China is accelerating domestic research. The United States is deepening coordination with both Japan and the Netherlands to build a three-country chokehold around advanced manufacturing. Korea is cautiously observing, knowing it may become the next target of global materials diplomacy. Europe talks about sovereignty, but remains a marginal player in this domain. The competition is moving into a space where very few countries can play. Building chip fabs is expensive, but many nations could theoretically pursue it if they had enough capital. Building a chemistry ecosystem that can produce EUV-grade photoresist at scale is on a completely different level. It requires not only money and talent, but also historical depth, accumulated practice, and integrated industrial sophistication that spans everything from polymer science to specialized equipment manufacturing. Japan built this over generations. China is trying to build it in a decade. The United States once had some of it, but let it drift overseas. Europe maintains pockets of expertise, but lacks industrial heft. And Korea is strong in electronics, but still follows Japan in material science. So here we are in 2025, with global semiconductor tensions rising, military competition sharpening, and nations scrambling to secure supply chains that weren't even considered strategic 10 years ago. And yet the quiet fact remains, the most critical bottleneck in the entire advanced chip race may be a few canisters of resist materials sitting in Japanese warehouses. If those canisters stop moving across borders, the impact would be broader and longer-lasting than most people imagine. Neither Japan nor China wants a break in the supply chain. The consequences would cut both ways. But the possibility is no longer academic. The strategic environment has changed. What was once a niche chemical is now seen as a strategic lever.
and in a geopolitical climate where countries increasingly use trade, technology, and materials as instruments of power, the idea that Japan could impose a tech quarantine on China is no longer far-fetched. No dramatic naval confrontation is required for that scenario. No one needs to fire a shot. The switch exists. It is chemical, quiet, and devastating in the right circumstances. Whether anyone ever chooses to flip it is a question that will shape the technological direction of the next decade.